Is it on? Okay. Okay. These readings are from our daily reading this book this week. The thoughts of the corrupt mind are incapable of perceiving the things of God. All its desires, delights, cares, and fears are wrapped up in this present world and are therefore fleshly. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. The stress of the saints' battle is not in resisting flesh and blood, but in combating principalities and powers in the unseen world of spirits. Is it strength you boast of? Your marrow will dry in your bones, your sinews shrink, and your legs bow under the weight of your puny body. We enter and leave the world alike. If such is the composition of all flesh, why place your faith in any man? Trust not in any man, not even yourself. You have no life to lose if you have already given yourself to Christ. Today's scripture reading is from Hebrews 4, verses 11 to 13. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, we will fall. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. So be it. Teresa, you did wonderful. There was a lot of big struggling words in there. So if you haven't seen up here, I've got some of the drawings from the Bible project that I put up here. And if you'll notice in Hebrews, it's going to talk about some of the same things that I'm going to talk about today, that we don't know who the author is or where the audience, who the audience is. But what we do know, and that's the message of this um, sermon is that Jesus is greater. And if you look at the blocks here, it talks about that Jesus is greater than the angels in the Torah. Jesus is greater than Moses in the Promised Land. Jesus is greater than the priests in Melchizedek. Jesus is gr the greatest sacrifice and the greatest covenant, and with each one there's some warnings. So these sheets may be very helpful. I've got copies up here of all the New Testament so that they can help you study. Jesus is the greatest thing even since sliced bread, whether you believe that or not. So let's start by prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that you would send your son to die for us, that you would create us knowing that that's what you would have to do, that you love us so passionately, that it is your will that none would perish, but that all would come to Jesus and have eternal life. We thank you for Jesus' righteousness, for his sacrificial death on the cross for us, and we thank you that he told us when he gave us the Great Commission, that he would always be with us. He would never abandon us. We thank you for your spirit, Lord. Quicken us through your spirit today to hear your words. May your words become alive, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and cutting us to the bone and to the marrow, Father. We just thank you and praise you. Let us hear your words and be doers of your words also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Also on the other side is something I'm going to close with. Basically what it is is the scriptures that I'm going to go over today. Um, Jesus is the greatest. He's greater than anything else. But is Jesus the greatest to you? That's the question that I'm going to start off with by asking everyone here. Because Jesus should be the greatest to you. You won't worry about the coronavirus if Jesus is the greatest for you. You won't worry about death that comes in your family or anything else as Shonda was talking about. You'll know that God is in control of all things and if He loves you so much that nothing will separate you from His love, that your victory has been obtained through Jesus Christ, that you carry His righteousness and that you will spend eternity with God. <sighs> 
the peace that surpasses all understanding. And to know that we have a mission while we're still breathing on this earth to tell others about that love, that peace, that joy that we have. It should be overwhelming to you if Jesus is the greatest to tell everyone else about that. So this week you should have started reading the book of Hebrews. You did read the book of Hebrews, right? Okay. I know that some of you have told me that you have been falling behind. Catch up. Okay? You did. Praise God. Thank you. <laughs> Five minutes a day is what it takes to do the reading. And as you read, you will hunger and thirst and you will want to read more. And I'm not telling you not to read more than five minutes. Study the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, I wish I'm going to get to preach on it three times, I think. I wish I could preach on it all year. It is such a wonderful book to look back and encompass the Old Testament together with the New and see how great Christ is. See how important the Word of God is in spending that relationship with Him. To fix our eyes on Jesus until we reach glory. So you should have read chapters 1 through 5. As it says in the thing here, we don't know who the audience is. We don't know who the author is. I've said before I like to think maybe it's Barnabas, but that's just my thoughts. Whoever it was, we get some clues from the letter. They're well-versed in Judaism. They go based off eyewitness accounts. They're well-educated in, in the Greek language of the day also. It appears to be a letter to all Jewish Christians and Gentiles also, but there's a good knowledge of Old Testament. And as you read through the New Testament, what gets quoted? The Old Testament. So it is relevant to us. So many churches today just preach on the New Testament and don't think a thing about the Old Testament. But the God that we worship, the God of Israel, is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And He is a holy, righteous God who desires and requires a holy, righteous people. Nothing has changed. And Hebrews goes into that. Moses gave the law, but we cannot keep it, can't we? Because we're dirty, rotten sinners, each and every one of us. No matter how much you've been sanctified and you're walking more and more like Christ every day, you're still a sinner saved by grace. By Christ's finished work on the cross. Because Jesus looks at you through Christ's righteousness. Wow. That He would love me that much. That there's no sin that I could ever commit in the past or in the future that would keep me from His love if I put my faith hope, and trust in Christ. How terrible will it be on that day when there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth by people who went to church their whole life, who read their Bible through and through, who even cast out demons in the name of Jesus, but didn't have a personal relationship with Him. It's simple again. I'll put it in childlike terms as Jesus said. I have a father. Jacob has a father. Each of you here have a father. And if that father is a good father at all, there's nothing that you can ever do to stop him from loving you. How much greater is our heavenly father? There is nothing that you can do that will stop him from pouring out his love for you. He proved it when he sent his son to the cross. He proved it when he created in you a new creation in Christ Jesus when He sealed you with His Spirit. He'll prove it again to you when Jesus claims you for His very own, if you put your faith and trust in Him. The book of Hebrews also talks about the sacrificial system that is still going on. So we can date the letter to previous to A.D. 70 when Jerusalem is destroyed. But that's all the clues that we have, but we have so much meat in this letter. It's not like the letters that Paul wrote. It's more like a college lecture or thesis. We don't get an introduction like we do. We get a statement of a fact, statement of a few facts. And then the author goes on to prove his point so beautifully using Old Testament Scripture. <clears throat> There's no salutation. It just starts with two facts. In the past, 
God spoke to people through the prophets. In the present, which is now, God speaks to people through Jesus. Now, what does that mean? That means prayer, yes. That means the Word of God, yes. That means that the Word of God is living and active, and every time you read it, no matter how many times you've read Hebrews, you're going to get something out of that's going to cut you to the very core if you put your faith and trust in Jesus. This letter is all about Jesus being the greatest, greater than anything else that you can think of. And that reminds me when the disciples are watching him get ready to go to heaven and they say, but we need to know the answers to these things. And Jesus says, no, you don't. All you need to know is that you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. So I challenge you again is where are you witnessing to your family, your friends, your Jerusalem, your Judea? Where is your light shining by your good works so that people can see your Father in heaven and give Him glory? Ironically, last week my, Peter, my scripture was from 2 Peter. In our NLT Bibles that some of you I hope are reading, and others of you can get one, I'll show you what it is. I might even have some copies, I don't know. You can follow along with it. It doesn't matter that it's in chronological order. You just look for Hebrews and it tells you it starts on page 1760 and then you read along. But it's covered with notes th throughout. It is a good study Bible written in chronological order. And on the other side of the page of Hebrews happens to be our scripture from last week, from 2 Peter. Isn't that ironic? It's a God thing, isn't it? <laughs> we read... From 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1, and my verses are going to be from NLT since that's what I'm reading here. This is my second letter to you, dear friends, and in both of them I have tried to stimul stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. That's why we gather together so that we can do that. That's why we read daily. That's why we pray daily so we can rely on Jesus to stimulate and refresh us to who we are to God and who we are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, I want you to remember what the holy prophets said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Sounds a lot like the beginning of Hebrews, doesn't it? If you look at the header in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, the day of the Lord is coming. Again, Hebrews goes off the same theme. If the day is the Lord is coming and you don't fear it because perfect love has cast out all fear of judgment, then you should be living in grateful expectation of it. Actually, even hurrying the day along when Jesus Christ returns is what Scripture tells us. <clears throat> On the very next page, page 1761, we have the starting of Hebrews. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, which Mark read, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Very similar to what Peter closed with. And now in these final days, He has spoken to us through His Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, He created the universe. No other New Testament book, even though we don't know the author, we don't know the audience, anything else, ties together the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, with the New Covenant. The Old Testament, that was great. There was nothing wrong with the law. The problem is us. We cannot keep the law. God's standard hasn't changed. That's why we have to look at the Old Testament. Nothing has changed there. God requires us to be holy if we are to be His people. We are set apart from the world to behave differently so that they see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. But we can't do it on our own. Paul said the law only pointed out what a wretched man he was and how desperately he needed someone to save him. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hebrews quotes the Old Testament 96 times according to the Blue Letter Bible commentaries in such a short book. Now Matthew quotes a little bit more, but it's 28 chapters. I believe it's 28 chapters. Hebrews is 
13, I believe. If I'm wrong, don't stone me. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I don't have it written down. And nearly a hundred times is Old Testament Scripture quoted to prove the point that Jesus is greater. Greater than anything else. So therefore, He should be the greatest thing in your life. It stresses our holiness and it stresses the sacrificial system when it starts out. But guess what? Jesus took care of that. God requires blood. As we see back in the Old Testament in Egypt and everything. He requires blood. He requires life because of our sin against Him. And this sacrificial sin pointed to a better way. God's only Son, who would sacrifice and pour out His life to save us. Wow! I cannot fathom that God would do that for me, but I can accept it. <laughs> and I can live by that power. The blood of Jesus Christ makes me as white as snow, no matter how wretched and dark that I am. Therefore, Jesus, the new covenant, is a much, much better way that He would give up His life to save me. We talked about in men's Bible study uh, Friday. I asked a question. I said, what would you do? You don't know, of course, but if you knew that today was your last day here on earth, how would you spend this evening? And there was good answers there and stuff. I'd go call all my friends and tell them about Jesus. What did Jesus do? He spent it with His closest friends. Not His blood kin necessarily, but those who believed in Him. Even though they struggled and didn't know what was going on at this point, Scripture says He longed to spend that night with His disciples, His followers. He yearned for it. The last night that he had before he went to the cross. And what did he do? Scripture says that he loved them. He poured out his love on them. He told them of this new and better way. And then he washed their stinking feet. He humbled himself to as low as he could put himself before he put himself on the cross. And said... You'll do the same thing if you love me. You will lay down your life to save a friend. That's what Jesus did on the last night that he knew he was going to die the next day. Problem is, we don't know when we're going to die. So Scripture tells us to live every day as if it were our last day. The notes in here in, the, in this New Living Bible, I want to read some of them. On Hebrews 1... And it's tiny reading, so hold, bear with me. <laughs> the book of Hebrews describes in detail how Jesus Christ not only fulfills the promises and prophecies of the Old Testament, but is better than everything in the Jewish system of thought. The Jews accepted the Old Testament, but most of them rejected Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. The recipients in this letter seem to have been Jewish Christians. They were well-versed in Scripture, and they had professed faith in Christ. Whether through doubt, persecution, or false teaching, they may have been in danger of giving up their Christian faith. Now, in this country, we got doubt. We don't really have persecution. Oh, boy, do we have false teaching. And we have complacency and laziness and idols. Oh, how I hear so many times, we don't have idols anymore. <laughs> Wrong. There are so many idols that keep us from living a life for God. You work so that you have food, maybe some clothing. You don't work for bigger houses, bigger cars. You work six days so that you can rest on the seventh day and remember God so that you can remember this eternal rest that Hebrews talks about. So you don't miss that because you had head knowledge and not heart knowledge. That you even cast out demons in Jesus' name, but didn't know Jesus personally. Don't miss out on that hope. 
God uses many approaches to send His message to people in the Old Testament. He spoke to Isaiah in visions, to Jacob in dreams, to Abraham and Moses He spoke personally. Jewish people familiar with these stories would not have found it hard to believe that God was still revealing His will. But it was astonishing to them to think that God had revealed Himself by speaking through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment and the culmination of God's revelation through the centuries. When we know Him, we have all we need to be saved from our sin and to have a perfect relationship with God. Jesus was God's agent in creating the world, for through Him, God created everything. As followers of Christ, we give easy, easy assent to this truth, but we deny it in practice. We may believe that Christ knows and controls the laws of heaven pertaining to salvation and spiritual growth, but we may act each day as though our financial, family, or medical problems are beyond His reach. If Jesus created the universe, then no part of life is out of His control. Not only is Jesus the exact representation of God, but He is God Himself. Going back to 2 Peter, Peter was writing this letter to scattered Christians abroad who had been persecuted and lost everything. But they had put their faith in Jesus Christ and they were living this new way. They were called as followers of the way. And in first, 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4, we read, Most importantly, I want to remind you that in these last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. Seems like the last days. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was created. Jesus hadn't come back. It's been 2,000 years. Is He coming? Has He forgot about us? Surely He won't come today. I can put off to tomorrow the things that are pertaining to Jesus. Today I can do the things pertaining to me. Surely He won't come tomorrow. That's what they were saying back in Peter's day. Peter, remember, was an eyewitness. He walked with Jesus and just these short, short years after Peter was already, people were already saying, Jesus isn't coming back. He's surely not coming back soon. Follow your own <coughs> desires. It's a shame that the American dream has turned into what it has because it was a dream to pursue religious freedom. Now it's a dream to pursue prosperity and anything you want goes. People, Peter was talking to a people who were saved by faith, telling them that they needed to live by faith no matter what the world was doing. The judgment was coming. Spoiler alert, that's exactly what the author of Hebrews goes on to do and he gives us this long list of people from the Old Testament that lived by faith. <coughs> by faith, Noah. By faith, Rahab. And we'll get to Hebrews 11, I'll talk more about that. They did something. They lived a certain way because of the faith that they had even before they knew that God loved them so much that He would give His only Son to save them. 2 Peter 11 and verse 11 goes on to say, Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day and hurrying it along. You heard me say that earlier. If you want Jesus to come, then hurry it along. Tell someone about Jesus. It might be the last person that was supposed to be saved. And you might have the privilege of bringing the gospel message to them. And then Jesus returns. If you don't think times are pointing towards it, and they have, but they're, they're getting more and more, it does seem like. Jesus comes to bring order to a lost, chaotic world. And that's where we're at, guys. Looking forward to the day of God, because you don't have any fear of judgment, and hurrying it along. On that day, He will set the heavens on fire, and the elements will melt away in the flames. 
but we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth that He has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, what should you do? Make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. Don't forget your mission. Don't forget the great suggestion. Oh, no, it's not a great suggestion, is it? It's a great commission. You are commissioned, given the power and authority from Jesus because it was given from Him in all of heaven and all on earth, and He said, Go therefore as a result and tell the world about Me. And don't worry because I will never forsake you. I'll be right there with you the whole time. Peter had already wrote in his, written in his first letter, in Peter, 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 8, You love Him even though you have never seen Him. Though you do not see Him, you trust Him. You put your trust in things not seen. Spoiler alert, that's what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. Faith is the complete confidence in things we cannot see. And then in verse 7, which I told you is my motto verse, by faith Noah, even though he hadn't seen these things, a flood, a boat, whatever he hadn't seen, he denied the world and lived by faith and built an ark to save his family to bring them into salvation. And what more way than the greatest way of all, salvation through Jesus Christ, to tell the world about what God's love has done for me by sending His Son to die for me, that I might live. <clears throat> you love Him even though you have never seen Him. Though you do not see Him, you trust Him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. I'm a Christian, are you? No, I'm a Christian. Do you know about Jesus? The reward for trusting Him, the reward for trusting Him will be the salvation of your souls. That puts a little more on than just John 3, 16 and believing, doesn't it? Because believing in the Bible means to put your trust, your faith, your hope in. Not just believe it's raining, or snowing, whatever it's doing, because I see it, but believe that God is in complete control and Jesus has saved me and I can trust in Him. This salvation has something, was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation that is prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when He told them in advance about Christ's suffering and His great glory afterwards. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful. It is wonderfully good news that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. So prepare your minds for act, action and exercise self-control. Put all of your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So, since all that is the case, you must live as obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living and satisfy your own desires. You, don't, you didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. Not what you believe, what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of Him during your times here as temporal residents. That's why Noah, out of holy fear, built an ark. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was with the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose Him as your ransom your personal ransom long before the world ever began 
But now in these last days He has been revealed for your sake through Christ, through God's only Son, you have come to trust in God. See how He's greater? Now, I wasn't reading from Hebrews. I was reading from Peter. <laughs> in Hebrews chapter 10, these are the words written. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that He has promised. For in just a little while the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose soul will be saved. Man, those words echo each other that Peter has wrote, that the author of Hebrews has wrote, that many words in the New Testament we write. And the early church who were giving up their possession, selling their land because they didn't consider anything to be their own, who were persecuted and faced death daily for what they believed in, for putting their trust in Jesus. And constantly we see that Satan is fighting the spiritual battle with them. It's not about what we see. It's about these wars that we rage with principalities and powers. Because Satan wants to keep you from heaven. And then if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, he wants to make you ineffective for the kingdom so you don't do any good for it. When you accept Jesus Christ, that's why the suffering and persecutions begin. You have to give up your life, your desires to follow after Him. If you don't, you're still following after the one who has your allegiance, the devil. And He wants you to be ineffective so that you won't receive the rewards that you should have received. So you won't live the life of worth that you should have lived. Because you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are gone. Do not let the devil tell you otherwise. Faith is tough because you cannot see it. But you have complete and utter confidence in Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross. Back to the beginning of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says, The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. Jesus Christ is God. He sustains everything by His mighty power, the mighty power of His sins, so He can sustain anything in your life. When He had cleansed us from all of our sins, He sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. He is greater than anything we could ever imagine. Verse 3, the book of Hebrews links God's saving power with His creative power. In other words, the power that brought the universe into being and that keeps it operating is the very power that cleanses us from our sins, that cleanses Alan from his sins, that cleanses you from your sins. The power that created things out of nothing is the power that saves you. And not just the power that saves you, but the power that gives you new life in Christ. So if you don't believe that, you're believing a lie from the devil. You are a new creation in Christ created to do good works that God planned for you before you ever came into existence. Hey, sweetheart. Verse 4 of Hebrews 1. This shows that the Son is far greater than angels, just as the name God gave Him is greater than their names. As you read in Scripture, if you read in Matthew, or you read wherever, if you read back in the Old Testament, when angels come around, <laughs> men drop dead by of fear, fainted, not just drop dead. They were, were so amazed by the power, the glory, the thunder, whatever things, that they were literally scared to death, that term, because the power that angels came. They were messengers of God, bringing whatever God brought. 
And here the author of Hebrews says that Jesus is far greater than them. Proof number one that you've read so far is Jesus is far greater than angels who are God's messengers whose power is unfathomable to us and Jesus is far greater than that. As you read through Hebrews, you'll also see warnings. So we got the first proof, Jesus is far greater than angels. But in Hebrews chapter 2, we read the first warning. In verse 1, so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. For the message God delivered through angels has always stood firm, and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes you think that we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced to us by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to, to us by those who heard him speak? If you read the Old Testament and you think God was a vengeful, mighty God, then how do you think he's going to be on Judgment Day when his son comes back to claim his own who came from heaven and gave it up, humbled himself, washed feet on the night he died, and laid down his life so you could live? What are you going to say to him that you did with your life? Are you going to bring God glory and honor? Are you going to pray, Thy will be done and Thy kingdom come? Or is it going to have the conditions on what you won't put into it? Proof number two, Jesus is greater than Moses, the one who walked with God, who when the people trembled when fire came upon the mountain and God was there, no, um, Noah, <laughs> Moses was there listening to God, recording his law so he could give it to the people. Jesus is far greater than Moses. Warning number two in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. But Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire house. And we are God's house. A builder has to build a house, doesn't it? If we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ, He'll build that house. Verse 7, that is why the Holy Spirit says, Today when you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, as Israel did when they rebelled and when they were tested in the wilderness. There our ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw miracles for 40 years. The Israelites still rejected Jesus, even though they saw the mighty miracles that He did by the finger of God. He came into Jerusalem with Lazarus, who he had raised from the dead. People were gathering around to see that. But they didn't want to put their faith and their trust in him. They didn't want to give up their own desires to follow after Jesus and make him Lord. Verse 10, So I was angry with them, and I said, Their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger I took an oath, they will never enter my place of rest. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters, make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. That's why the author of Hebrews goes on to write to meet together regularly not get out of the habit of doing that. To come together and encourage one another, to sharpen one another, to use the gifts the Spirit has given you to build up, not tear down. Verse 14, For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we f first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. All that belongs to the Son of God who sits at the right hand of the Father. We will share in that. Verse 15, remember what it says, Today when you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. And who was it that, who rebelled against God? Even though they heard His voice, wasn't it the people that Moses led out of Egypt? And who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose corpses lay in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when He took an oath that they would never enter His rest? 
Wasn't it the people who disobeyed him? So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to enter that permanent rest, that eternity where there's no pain, no suffering, no death, where every tear has been wiped away, where there is nothing that is not of God there. There is no sin. Everything is perfect. That is the rest that I am longing for, the hope that I am living for, that Jesus told me that I can be confident of, that I have complete and utter assurance that that will be the case because Jesus Christ is greater. To all who put their faith and trust in Him, there will be eternal rest. Chapter 4 gives proof number 3. Jesus is far greater than any of the high priests. And then there's also a third warning. It was our scripture this morning. So let us do our best to enter this rest. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fall. Not we might. We will fall. The next word is a preposition. For the word of God is alive and powerful. So that ties it to our doing our best so that we don't disobey God, so that we don't fail to enter His rest. So how do we combat that? Right here, because it's living and alive. It will cut you to the core. It will quicken you. It will create in you a desire to be more like Christ as you read and understand what Christ did for you because God loves you so much. For the word of God is alive, it is powerful, it is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. It cuts between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. And if you read commentaries, most commentaries don't even know what that means. <laughs> what is the dividing point between soul and spirit? Who cares? You can quote me on that. What matters is that the word of God will quicken you that much. Whatever that means, it will make you alive the way you were designed and created to be and the way that you were ransomed back and redeemed to be. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires so that when Judgment Day we can have complete confidence, so that we can re receive rewards for what we have done in the body. Verse 13, nothing and all of creation is hidden from God. Nothing. He knows everything. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes. And He is the one to whom you are accountable. Now you also read chapter 5, but I'm going to wait till next week to talk about that. I want to read you one more note from here for what this Bible gives in the commentary about Hebrews chapter 4. And yeah, i got to pick it up to read it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Word of God is not simply a collection of words from God, a vehicle for communicating ideas. It is a living, life-changing, and dynamic as it works in us with the incisiveness of a surgeon's knife. God's Word reveals who we are and what we are not. It penetrates to the core of our moral and spiritual life. It discerns what is within us, both good and evil. The demands of God's Word require decisions. We must not only listen to the Word, we must also let it shape our lives as it cuts. That's why I had Teresa read also from the devotional. Because that devotional is very good on talking about this subject, that we're fighting a spiritual war. And we need God's Spirit. We need God's Word. We need prayer. We need to totally rely on the one who gave his life up to save us, Jesus Christ. And as we come closer and closer through his Word, through prayer, through meeting together, the more and more that we will live as the children of God should. Fully relying, fully trusting on Jesus, who is the greatest.
who became flesh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, so that not only we could read God's Word, but we could physically see what humans can live like for God, what they were designed to live for. And of course we have to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow after Him as we do that. We have to submit to His will rather than our own. It's a daily, minute-by-minute minute battle that we fight. But we are united with one another. We have the Spirit of God. We have His Word. And we have it so much more today. Any translation that you can think of on any media device, everything else, commentaries, there's no excuse for this generation. Many times people were found in older times with a Bible on them were simply put to death and their Bible burned with them to stamp out the Word. And we can carry it around in our pocket wherever we go. How much more accountable do you think God is going to hold this generation? Are you reading and studying the Bible with your church? Is the Word of God becoming alive more and more in your life? These are the scriptures that I just went over. And I'm going to quickly read through them. You can have a copy if you want. But this is going back and forth to Hebrews and Peter. And I kind of wrote it, if you've ever seen God's love letter, where it puts verses together. It makes such a wonderful thing when you read the verses like that. But this tells a story from two different authors, two different books written at two different times. This is my second letter to you, dear friends, and in both of them I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember that the whole, what the holy prophets said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commands through your apostles. Long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days He has spoken to us through His Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son He created the universe. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again. From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, He will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth that He has promised. A world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was with the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose Him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days He has revealed for your sake, through Christ you have come to trust in God. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that He has promised. For in just a little while the coming, will come, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And He sustains everything by the mighty power of His command. When He had cleansed us from our sins, He sat down in the place of honor in the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the Son is far greater than angels, just as the name God gave Him is far greater than their names. So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. For the message God delivered through angels has always stood firm in every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus Himself and then delivered to us by those who heard Him speak? But Christ, as the Son of God, is in charge of God's entire house. And we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. That is why the Holy Spirit says, Today when you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for forty years. 
So I was angry with them, and I said, Their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as we did when we first believed, we shall share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says, Today when you hear His voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. And who was it who rebelled against God, even though they heard His voice? Wasn't it the people that, God, that Moses led out of Egypt? And who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose corpses lay in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when He took an oath that they would never enter His rest? Wasn't it the people who disobeyed Him? So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter His rest. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fall. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting even between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes, and He is the one to whom we are accountable. Jesus is the greatest. I hope that the Word of God will cut you to the very core as we read through. Father, I thank You and praise You that Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, that Your Word has stood the test of time, that we can have it as a personal copy that we hold in our hands, and we're not even persecuted for it. Our life isn't put on the line. Lord, let us see the privilege that we have of studying Your Word, of telling others of Your love through Jesus Christ. May the Spirit and Your Word as we read it sanctify us through and through. May we be the people that follow after Christ. May we be like our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Thank You for this church. Thank You for Your Spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.